Jesus Christ, I might add, is the full revelation of Jesus Christ, and that within it there would be things that he was going to write about that would be past, present, and future things to come, and so that's where we started talking about, and in Revelation, uh, well tonight we're going to do part 23 of the Things Yet to Come series. Last week we started to discuss uh, the title, After the Thousand Years, and so tonight we're picking up with that, where we left off and say after the thousand years continued. Now, if you bring up the next slide, the subtopic of probably what I'm going to try to steer into tonight is the resurrection of the dead. And I want to talk to us about it. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, as I got into this, I found myself being drawn into another little side trail for just a little bit. So I doubt that we're going to get this done tonight either. <laughs> But nevertheless, here we are. We're going to get into it. Let's pray. In Jesus' name. Father, we love you. We thank you for your anointing and your presence. Uh, and I'm asking you, God, to help us tonight as we study your word. Lord, put a hunger in your people for your word. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Before you're seated, greet, shake hands, who, whatever you can, whoever you can reach around you and bless them in the name of the Lord. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you to really kind of, you're going to have to kind of keep up with me in your mind a little bit tonight. I'm going to share some things that I feel like that the Lord kind of showed me a new, it's not, not really a new thing, but a new level perhaps of maybe an understanding of an old thing or maybe a better way that maybe a, that it can be explained. But as a way of recap, it appears uh, we, we bring up Revelation 20, because what we started with last week as a recap is John, in, ha, we're coming to the end of the book of Revelation, and he says in verse 4 that I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given unto them, and, and so he's talking about judgment and, and governmental positions are being given, so he's referring to this millennial reign. And then he said, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and that had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Everybody say a thousand years. So in verse um, uh, 4, he is describing something. Well, he goes on in verse 5, and he says, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years was finished. Now, uh, and then he, he describes this by saying this is the first resurrection. Not, not verse 5. The first resurrection he was describing is verse 4, the thing that he just saw. And after he explained that that is the first resurrection, he said, Now, the, the, the rest of the dead, that's a different resurrection. And so they're, they're, they're split, and, and it seems pretty evident that the thing that is the divider between these two major resurrections is the millennial reign, or the thousand-year reign. Now, but the, the focus is on the first resurrection, so verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, and here's why, because on such, in other words, those that are involved in the first level of re re resurrection, the second death will have no power on them. Can you say amen to that? And, uh, and the second death, we find out in, in a little while, is the lake of fire. But they, that, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this is referring to a resurrection of the dead that is going to take place before the, the millennial reign. There's another one that's going to happen at the end of the millennial reign. Then he talks about not only two resurrections, but he talks about two deaths. Um, the first death, of course, that we all face is the death of our flesh, where our mortality takes on immortality. And then the second death, uh, he identified later on in the chapter or in the next as the lake of fire. Now, and bring up the, the, the next slide, if you would. I want to remind you, this is a slide I, I created last week, because... 
when, whenever we're discussing eschatology, which is the study of, of, of the end times, there's various philosophies out there. Uh, some of them are, uh, I think, a little nonsensical, but there's two or three that are um, certainly worthy of discussion and, and, and can have various people, uh, you know, seeing it one way versus seeing another way. What I have concluded is I call it the tree trunk analogy, and what I mean by that is I want you to view that tree as the, the, the base of it. You've got to understand the tree is Jesus. The roots is Jesus. And the trunk is Jesus. Jesus talked about, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Okay, When you get up into the tree level of the thing where all the branches are, the, the branches branch off of, of larger trunks. Okay, So there, when you get to a certain level in scriptural eschatology that all of a sudden there's, there's branches that you can, you can branch off on, if I could say it that way. Decisions that you make in the early stage of the crossroads will tend to guide how you see everything else from there on. That's the, that's the point that I'm saying. So, uh, for example, when we discuss the, the uh, controversies of whether the, the coming of the Lord for the church, is that going to be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, a lot of it has to do with, because the funny thing is, Every position is using the same verses to argue their point. <laughs> and, and so it's not an issue of, of, of this verse trumps that verse. It's an issue of how you're viewing a verse. And so how you view it tends to be choices that you make early on in the Scriptures. That's the point I'm trying to make. And I think this is true in this case as well. And, 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 it, 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 and so it is with the resurrection of the dead as well is what I'm getting to. Now, one last thing I want to recap. Bring up Daniel 12. We ended on this verse last week. <coughs> Daniel said, At that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there should be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even uh, to that same time. And at that time, everybody say that time. Thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in a book. Now remember, this is Old Testament prophecy that is going to, of, about things that are going to take place way into the future, involving judgment. Now watch what happens. Now, and, and by the way, remember this was written to the Jews. That's very important to understand, that the Old Testament was written to the Jews. It was not written to the church. Church didn't exist yet. Um, and in verse 2, he connected something to that day. He said, at that day, looking down the road, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay. Now, that, that's the basic ending, uh, uh, two opposite endings. Everyone is going to be resurrected from the dead at some point. The question is, is how's it going to end? Well, there's not a lot of controversy to that. <laughs> there's only really two basic Bible choices. We're either going to be raised up into life or we're going to be raised up into judgment. The question is, um, <clears throat> the theological question is, is when does this happen? Okay. Now, those that have more of a historical view of things and believe that most of this prophecy was fulfilled by 70 A.D. would say, Okay, then this is what it's talking about, and it, it, it ends here in reference to Israel. But uh, it's either that or it has to be futuristic. Okay, so now to me, as I've been teaching, I take the futuristic view, and one of the reasons is this verse. He connected, uh, and he said, in that day, looking at down the road when all this happened, he connected the resurrection of the dead uh, to that. Now, there is a sum of a resurrection of the dead that took place when Jesus rose again. We're going to get into that tonight, maybe, <laughs> depending on the time. Uh, but I don't, I don't see, or uh, there's no recorded resurrections that are associated with A.D. 70. And so, uh, again, I, that's another reason why I keep looking to the futuristic view. But let's talk about this first resurrection, because as I can understand it now, in study, and it appears that the first resurrection happens in stages. In other words, it's not an event that just happens all at one time, but it has 
some stages to it. But collectively, all together, they are considered the first resurrection. Now, I want to I point out, there are individual people who have been raised from the dead just by the miraculous power of God. And it's pretty stunning when I realized that I, I can testify that I have two personal friends of ministry that I know, they're elders to, to, to me, that have been raised from the dead. And I got to thinking about that. I thought, you know, that's quite a statement to make. <laughs> And, and I'm just kind of making it, pli- you know, plausibly, like it's no big deal. <laughs> but, but yeah, I have been encountered in Ethiopia, and and was and uh, when a man was brought that had been just raised from the dead, just coming to the meeting. So there's individuals, and we have rec- record of that in the in the Bible. Okay, now anytime somebody's raised from the dead, uh, yes, I mean that is a resurrection from death. But that's not, I don't think, what the Bible's talking about when he says the first resurrection. In other words, those are individual situations, whereas the resurrection is something that is going to happen collectively to a group. And so resurrections are collective, whereas individual stories and testimonies are, are interesting. It's also noted, interesting to note, that in the Old Testament there were two types, or there were Old Testament types and shadows of future resurrections. The two classic ones is Enoch and Elijah. And an Enoch represented a pre-Israel time of conscience way early in, in, in human's history. Uh, Enoch was the first, by the way, to prophesy about saints returning uh, with Christ in that great day uh, before anyone ever prophesied about it. Enoch saw it and was a prophet of God back in those days. And the reason we know that is because even the New Testament, Jude, quotes Enoch about this. And uh, Enoch represented, uh, or Elijah, excuse me, I think represented Israel and a post-Israel stage of the Old Testament that led up to Christ. But then Jesus himself comes along. And obviously, we know Jesus was, was, was identified as the first fruits. Everybody say the first stage. Bring up 1 Corinthians 15 on screen, verse 20. And now is Christ risen, the Apostle Paul says, from the dead. And, and as a result of that, he has become, everybody say become, the first fruits of them that slept or, or that died. For since by man came death, or by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, or all will die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay, so we're talking big generalities here. Every man in his own order. Everybody say order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward... They that are Christ's at His coming, which what we would call the dead in Christ, or the tribul- or the rapture of the church, and then of course the Bible is very clear that there's also a rapture at the end of the tribulation, which we is a, a, most interpreted as a rapture of tribulation saints. Those that have a post-trib philosophy would see the rapture of the church and the rapture of the tribulation saints as the same event. Uh, on the last, uh, at the very end of the tribulation at the great day. Either way, no matter where you put it, it still is the point that that it comes in phases. Okay, And so uh, Christ is the first fruits, and then after that, they that are dead in Christ. Uh, Then after that, he says, verse 24, then cometh the end. Everybody say the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, and when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, I believe, so here's, I believe he's talking about there is another resurrection, a general resurrection that's going to take place at the end of the thousand years or after the thousand years. 
<clears throat> and it's it's all and it's a it's a post millennial resurrection. Other and I think he's saying the order there. You're you're going to have Christ was first fruits. After that, the dead in Christ, uh, and then at the end, after he hath put down uh, <clears throat> the final. Uh, yeah, because the Bible says the final, the, the, the roughest thing that we have to fight against us is death. <coughs> Jesus is going to put it under everybody's feet at some point. Not just the church. Everybody's going to be resurrected from the dead. And uh, Now, concerning the discussion about whether <coughs> the rapture of the church happens mid-trib, post-trib, pre-trib, whatever, uh, I, I might add again, this verse is sometimes used and pointed out from those that have a post-trib view, they'll say those two are connected. Again, maybe. I still view it as, as an earlier thing. But another view is that, uh, that the resurrection at the end, which was the post-millennial one, the one at the very end, that was, remember when he said, and the rest live not again until. Okay, so there, there seems to be four stages Christ and then then the uh, the dead in uh, Christ himself the dead in Christ um, the tribulation saints again if those are two separate things or even if they're one and then there's a general resurrection that's going to happen at the very end that gets us ready for the white throne judgment so it, it, you can view that as just saying that the resurrection at the end meant it was the conclusion of all the various stages, that, that everybody's going to be resurrected, but every man in his order. So, again, I think you can, we can probably have some discussions as to what, what the timing of the stuff is, but I think the end result is, regardless of the timing, these are the things that are going to happen. So it appears that Jesus rose first, representing this. Secondly, the rapture of the dead. Third, the resurrection uh, of, of tribulation saints, uh, uh, at least is how I see it, and it appears that the Old Testament saints are a part of the resurrection that happens at the end of the uh, tribulation as, as far as those that were saved and believed. Those that were not saved or believed or however you want to say it are, are not going to happen until the end of the thousand years. Again, the timing might be controversial. We can stand, sit all night and discuss the timing, but the end of the stuff I think is pretty clear. So, bring up Luke chapter 14 real quick. <clears throat> I want to talk about this first resurrection. Uh, again, it seems to be comprised of stages. And so, listen to what Jesus said in verse 13. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Everybody say the just. So just a case in point, Jesus is saying that every one of us will be repaid whatever it is that he owes us. Everything's going to be made right after the resurrection of the just. But remember, that's different than the general resurrection. Okay? This is just a resurrection of the just. Now, bring up John chapter 5, 25 on screen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and Jesus said, and now is... When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man, or in other words, God in flesh. Verse 28, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all, everybody say all, that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Everybody say everybody. Eventually, everybody's going to, going to be raised and stand before him. And they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the their resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. I think this is what Daniel, you know, that we read earlier, was alluding to as well. So, again, we're not talking yet about the, disp the disposition of the cases and who's saved and who's not saved or whatever. We're just talking about that there are different resurrections. And basically, those that are saved are going to be resurrected at a different time 
than those that are going to be ultimately lost. Now, a little side note. This is where we start to get into a side note a little bit. Uh, part of the first resurrection that, that, that happened was Jesus, of course, himself. But the Bible says that after he was resurrected, there were others that were resurrected with him. And these were obviously Old Testament people. Okay. Now, the Bible just says many. We'll read the verse here in a little bit. But the question is, is who, what was this? <laughs> um, now, we know that Old Testament saints seem to be resurrected along with the tribulation saints at the end of the tribulation, which, if that's accurate, it makes sense that it would happen at the second coming because if, if you're viewing it from a, a general dispensational view, you would recognize that the tribulation is ultimately a wrap-up of God's issues or how he was dealing with the Old Testament Jews. So it would make sense in that light. But if you remember, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 30 says that after the resurrection and the second coming, the millennial reign comes. Uh, and then Daniel noted that that happens after Daniel's 70th week. So immediately we have several testim testimonies from the Word of God that the millennial reign is immediately after the tribulation. Now Daniel chapter 7 is talking about this reign. Listen to what he says in verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Everybody say everlasting kingdom. And all dominion shall serve and obey him. Now again, Daniel was prophesying to the Jewish people. And he prophesied that the kingdom that was coming, when that kingdom and dominion comes, it is, it is, it is going to become an everlasting kingdom. It will never end again. Now, so if Israel's story ended in A.D. 70, then the only way that you can interpret the kingdom being everlasting is if the church fulfills uh, that, that covenant or whatever. And again, this is, this is a, uh, a philosophy that's out there. It's actually called, it's one of the branches, I would say, uh, that you, you kind of have to decide on early how you think about it, which is a theory of, of theology called covenant theology. It has another name that it goes by sometimes. It's called supersessionism, uh, where the church supersedes Israel. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about this, the, the, that philosophy says that the coming of Jesus fulfills the covenant Jewish promises that God made to Israel, he fulfilled it through the Gentile church. Now, no matter how you cut it, what that means in essence at some point to me is that it gets very close to what is also known as replacement theology, which is saying that the, that the New Testament church or the Gentile church supersedes uh, Israel. Some would say, well, God made a covenant to Israel. Israel broke the covenant so the Gentile church came in and fulfilled it, and therefore, from that point on, God has no purpose or use for an Israeli nation from that point on. So if that's the correct way to look at it, then that's, that's how you would have to see that. That would mean that all the promises that were in the covenants that were made to Abraham are no longer to the Jewish people, as much as they become superseded by the New Testament church. And then the promises about the land and so forth, the certain parameters and so forth, that would no longer be to the people of Israel. It would become to, in other words, no longer the physical seed of Abraham. It would have to be generalized or universalized to the Gentile church. So the bottom line is, if, you, if, you come, if you're coming up the tree and early on you take that, that route, then that means every, every branch, every verse you read, everything in eschatology after that, you're going to see it through that light. Whereas if you come up through a dispensational branch, you're going to see it that way. That's why, that's how you have people that read the same verses and fuss with each other about which is right. 
because w when you're, when you're kind of going in circles over the same verse, you're understanding that's because of how you're interpreting it. Now, we also know that there is, only, there is no such thing as a private interpretation. So there's only one correct interpretation. So, and the truth is, we'll find out at the end. <laughs> As to, as to which was the best way to look at. In the meantime, I just suggest uh, putting the seatbelt on and hanging on, you know, to, to the end, no matter how this thing unfolds. So, but here's the problem with my mind. If, if, you, if you take the view that all of this ended, all of God, Israel's purposes ended at A.D. 70, which, which again, there's a lot of people that take this in, so it's no minor part of the branch. It's not huge numbers, but it's, it's not one of the smaller philosophies either. But if they do that, then they're saying that everything shifts to the New Testament church. Therefore, there's no future role for an Israeli nation. God doesn't have any purpose for it, uh, etc. Now, I will, I will say this. Until 1948, I can very much see how that would be an appealing concept. But either way, this theory becomes much, much more difficult and hazardous to try to figure out after 1948, or if you want to do 1967 when Jerusalem itself came back under Israeli rule. But here's, here's what my thinking is. Due to its miraculous nature, and I, I, want, to, I want to read something because I just it came up in my memories. It's something I posted a while ago. But some of you remember who Charles Kropmeyer was. He was a reporter. He was actually a Jewish man. But he, he had a meme. This is a great quote from him. He said, Israel is the only nation on earth that inhabits the same land, bears the same name, speaks the same language, and worships the same God that it did 3,000 years ago. Now that's a historical reality. Now, that's, now, so here's the point. When you study the history of nations and people and so forth, you come to one glaring reality after 1948, and that is that what happened in the creation of modern Israel is something that has never happened in the history of the world. Okay. Now, here's the point. When you study how the nation became a nation, you recognize the miraculous nature. There's no way it would have happened without some sort of spiritual intervention. Now that means to me that the invention, so to speak, of modern Israel is, is something that has to be explained theologically. You can't ignore that. Those, and, and I've talked with a, a, a small group, but I've talked with some that said, well, no, the church superseded Israel, and, and, and modern Israel means nothing. Modern Israel has no uh, prophetic, you know, concepts to it all. Well, I, I struggle with that, and I can't, I, can't, I can't take that path, because modern Israel is such an incredible, exceptional miracle. You have to explain it one way or the other. You, well, the one thing you can't do is just ignore it. And pretend that it's not there. Okay, So when you not only l l learn the long list of miraculous interventions it took to create the nation, then look at the last 70, 75 years at all the incredible, incredible miracles ongoing that sustains it. I mean, they have, they have literally thousands of rockets a year that are fired into that little territory. And I, I mean, it's, it's, it's been nonstop. And, of course, right now they're involved in the longest war that they've had in, their, in, their, in the modern Israeli history. So here, so, okay, the point is you've got to figure out in eschatology, when it comes to covenants and eschatology, and so forth, you've got to explain is modern Israel. Either it means something or it doesn't. I think that was so, so many miracles were involved in getting it, there's no way it doesn't mean anything. And so it, you, you got to put some sort of a value to it and explain it. So here, here's how I see it, at least at this point. It, it appears to me that when Jesus died on the cross, the last thing that he said was three words. He said, it is finished. The Bible says he gave up the ghost. Okay. So the last statement made in the flesh of Jesus Christ before death was, it is finished. So the question is, what is finished? Okay. 
Now, some that review the covenant theology say well, that the covenant was finished. The Old Testament covenant was done. I, uh, I, I, don't, I, I, I have a different way of looking at it, and here's, here's how I'm going to try to explain it. And, and I got, I, I'll be honest with you, I kind of got off on a side rabbit trail today on this one. <laughs> um, Tim, I believe what Jesus meant on the cross when he said, it is finished, I believe he was referring specifically to the law of Moses. I think you also perhaps could stretch it to also meaning the role of his flesh was coming to an end. It is done. What I've come to do in the flesh is finished. Okay, But the truth is what he came to do in the flesh was put away the law or to fulfill the law, the Bible says. I don't believe that, that he fulfilled all of the covenants to Israel, but I do believe he fulfilled the law. Now, I think that the Old Testament still has things which are promised that need to unfold to the Jewish people, including the millennial reign. Jews who believe this are known as Zionists. Okay. So if you talk to somebody who's a Zionist, usually that means that they're, they're a Jew that believes in, the, in, in you know, God's promises, the Old Testament. In other words, they're still looking for Messiah. They're still looking for the millennial reign. They're still looking for all this to unfold. That's Zionism. There's also a Christian version that, that many, many, not all, but many of the modern Christian churches embrace called Christian Zionism. And Christian Zionism is this. I'll read you just a, 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 a statement that gives an explanation. I thought this was good. It said, The return of the Jews to the, to the Holy Land and the restoration of a physical Israel is in line with biblical prophecy. This is the theory, or the, this is what Christian Zionism is. Christian Zionism is the conviction that the Jewish people are still entitled to possess the land of Israel for all time. Now, I would say, I would tell you, I fall into that camp. So here, here I am, I'm, I'm looking at things and recognizing that Jesus certainly fulfilled certain things of the covenant, and yet, at the same time, it does not appear that, that every aspect of the covenant was fulfilled. Because we ended up with a modern Israel that forces us to go back and take a look at how, how we viewed some of these verses. Let me show you what I mean. Deuteronomy 7 and 6 on screen. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. This is talking about the Jews. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. In other words, the Lord chose you. And he didn't choose you. He, he did not set his love on you or choose you because you were a great number or a great people. He said because you were the fewest of all. I've told people when they feel called to preach, don't get big-headed about it. He hath chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. <laughs> and usually when God's hand comes on you, it's very rarely coming on you because you're the, you're the greatest clay that's ever been. <laughs> And I don't mean the Clay family. He, they're, great, they're great Clays over there. <laughs> now, here's what's interesting. That was what was said about the Old Testament Jews. Okay, now, there's a New Testament uh, version of that. The New Testament church does, in fact, fulfill the role of Israel in the New Testament age. Because the wild branch gets engrafted in. We're going to deal with that in a minute. But go. let me show you the New Testament version. 1 Peter chapter 2 and 9 on screen. He says to the New Testament church, You are a chosen generation. Everybody say generation. Mm -hmm. The Greek word there was kent, genos. Excuse me, genos. You know, what, you know what it interprets in Greek? In the English, it means kin. You are now a chosen kin. Your family. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, which that means special, people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now watch, which in times past were not a people. He's talking to the Gentile church. He said, you, you were never the chosen people of God. You, you were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. So there's no question that the New Testament church has certain things that it comes in 
in to flow with Israel and fulfill certain things. There's no question about that. But the question is, does it fulfill Israel in such a way that Israel has no future purpose in a physical sense? I think the way to look at this is that the New Testament church does fulfill Israel's called purpose. If you remember why God created Israel in the Old Testament to begin with, he wanted to create a nation that would present the world, represent him to the world. He gave them a special nation with a special anointing, a special calling. He gave them special laws. He said, I want you to live a separated lifestyle. I want you to do this and that. I want your physical presence to be a representation of me. In other words, Israel's purpose uh, was to deliver the gospel to the whole world. And by gospel, I just mean the good news of God. But they failed at that. No question they failed at it. And, and by the way, that's why when Jesus came, the first thing he did, or I should say the last thing he did just prior to going to the cross, he meets with his handful of disciples and he gives them the great commission. And he says unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Why? Because that's what Israel failed to do. The New Testament Gentile church, even though he was talking to all Jews, the original 12 were Jews, He's talking to them, and he said, you're going to fulfill what the nation of Israel failed to do. The Gentile church is going to fulfill their calling. Now, that brings up a very legitimate theological question. And that's this. Does Israel rejecting the Messiah disqualify ethnic Israel from all covenants? That's a, that's a legitimate question. It's a fair question. And I'll be honest with you, up until 1948, it sure appeared so. It appeared very clearly, and that's why this particular couple of those doctrines were formulated. Uh, one, actually, that's the predominant one, like kind of we're talking about tonight, that was formulated in the 1500s. Um, by a Jesuit priest and so forth. But again, if you've gone a thousand years into the New Testament and had no, you know, had, had seen nothing of a physical Israel, you would have to, it's very easy to understand how you would conclude that everything that Israel was is being fulfilled in the New Testament church. Even in Paul's day, this was uh, a great issue of discussion and I might even add contention. I want everybody in the building to open your Bible and turn with me to the Romans chapter 11 because here's one of my little rabbit trails, and, and I'll get back to the, to the resurrection of the dead in a minute. But the reason this is important is because how you view Israel also has to do with, with the order in which the resurrection of the dead is going to take place. Okay. So again, the question on the table is, when the Jewish people rejected Jesus as Messiah, did that disqualify them from the Abrahamic covenant? or other aspects of it. So Paul seems to be addressing this very issue in chapter 1, and he's, I mean, verse 1, excuse me, chapter 11. I say then, and here's the same question, hath God cast away his people? Okay, that's what I'm asking. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm, he's asking it a whole lot quicker and easier than I am. <laughs> but he's asking the same question. Do you see that? He's, he's addressing the theological question here, just a matter of decades after Christ. It was already discussion. The, the complete Jewish Bible, which is a version that I enjoy using sometimes because it brings some clarity, it, uh, uses the word for castaway. It uses the word repudiate. They said, Paul, Paul asks, hath God repudiated his people? Now, What's interesting about the word you repudiate, it actually has four definitions. Now listen to this. I'm, I'm reading them right out of the dictionary. To repudiate something means to refuse to accept or be associated with it. Or it can mean to deny the truth or validity thereof. Or it could mean to refuse to fulfill or discharge an agreement or obligation or a debt. Or it could mean, especially having to do in times that are past, it means as divorcing one's wife. Okay. 
Now that's pretty, that's, I didn't even know it had all of those things. So think of, think of that because this is the question that Paul's using, that the Jewish Bible, did, did God, has God repudiated the Jewish people? Paul's answer was two words. Yell it out. God forbid. Or in other words, no. Okay, well now if he didn't, then how do we explain all this? He said, he said, I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and the tribe of Benjamin. And God hath not cast away, or in other words, again, there it is again by the Jewish Bible, repudiated. God has not repudiated his people, which he foreknew. Would, would ye not what the scripture saith of Elijah? In other words, do you remember what he said about Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. You remember that? But here he asked the question, he said, do you remember what God said to him? Now listen, watch this. He said, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. In other words, when Elijah himself was thinking that all hope of Israel was gone and that everybody had committed idolatry, God said, no, 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 I have a remnant. The promises of Israel are going to continue through the remnant. Everybody say the remnant. Say it again. Now here's the point. He brings that back to the, to the current theological question in verse 5. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Well, who are these people? These are the Jewish people, not... Not all the Jewish people rejected. They rejected as a nation, as, as, a, as a general people. But remember, everybody that received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost was Jewish. Over 3,000 of them the first day. You know, the, 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 the disciples were all Jewish. You know, the church in Jerusalem ended up numbering over 10,000 by the time you get to the fifth chapter of Acts. So, the point is, is that there were many Israelites and Jewish people who did receive New Testament truth. And I think what Paul is making the argument here is from a, from a covenantal standpoint to the, to the seed of Abraham. There's the, sea, the sands of the sea and there's the stars of the heaven. Israel, I, I think what he's saying is Israel rejected Messiah, but a remnant elected grace. And by faith, they entered into the New Testament covenant. And through that remnant, the promises of God to the seed of Israel is going to flow. Now watch close, because Paul said that the law has been fulfilled by Christ. And we know that. We're in grace now. Look at verse 6. For if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Other works... Other, otherwise, work is no more work. In other words, the whole conversation he's talking about here is the Mosaic Law. Okay, th this whole discussion is about the law. Paul's making the argument that Christ did, in fact, fulfill the law. So he goes in verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. In other words, they haven't got the, gotten to the goal that they were after. But, but, everybody say but. The election hath obtained it. And the rest, talking about Israel, the rest of the Jews were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. Eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, even to this day. It's, 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 pretty, it's fascinating stuff. I, I never quite... I, I, I was drawn today to, to delve into this whole chapter. Skip down to verse 11. I say then, have they, talking about the Jews and Israel, have they stumbled that they should fall? Now they did fall, but I think what he's saying here is, have they stumbled in such a way that they cannot get it back up? Have they stumbled in such a way that they have to stay down? He answers again with two words. 
God forbid. Everybody say, God forbid. But rather, now listen, rather through their fall is, is come under the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, I mean, you know, it's a sad thing to admit, but Israel's failure ended up blessing the world. <laughs> and it blessed just about everybody in this room tonight. But he, noted, he asked a fascinating question. He said, if the failure of physical Israel, even in their failure, if they, if they brought blessing to the world, how much more of a blessing do you think will come from their fullness? Thank you, but I didn't say it. Paul did. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm hoping maybe... the. Maybe the bells are ringing in your head. I know they did with me. It was like ding, ding, ding. I'm saying, whoa, 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 whoa. He's saying that physical Israel is not done with yet. Go to verse 13. For I, and now he's been talking. They said, now he said, now I speak to you Gentiles. Insomuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles and I magnify my office. It was always amazing to me that God picked a Pharisee of the Pharisees. <laughs> To become the Gentile, to become the apostle to the Gentiles. And I think maybe one of the reasons is number one, maybe his sense of humor. Number two, maybe that the Gentile church needed someone that could explain all this Jewish stuff because they couldn't understand it. And Paul was a master of it. Not only was he a Pharisee, the Pharisees, well trained. Feed a Gamal type of stuff. On top of all of that, he spent three years in the desert with Christ himself, being personally tutored. So there's nobody on the planet at that particular time that had more understanding of the interaction between the Jews and the Gentiles than the Apostle Paul. And so he says, I'm talking to you Gentiles now. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them that are of my flesh, and I might save some of them... Paul was acknowledging that the only way that Jews can be saved right now, it, they, they're not saved by Old Testament covenants. They're not saved by the law. All that's been put away. Animal blood's been put away. Nothing can save them unless they come through the New Testament church. They have to, become, they have to come into the New Testament church. My watch keeps going off. says, I didn't, I didn't understand that. I know I'm not talking to you. And Paul, Paul is saying, I'm hoping that I can get them to see it. I need to draw them in to have faith in this. And I, but, if, but the sad thing is, most of them have not. But here's the point. Theologically, verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? But of life from the dead. Notice Paul says, you know, when God fulfills His promises to them, what, how is that going to bless the, the world compared to what's already happened? Where am I at? Verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now we, we recognize Jesus is the, is the root. And the tree is, is Christ. But he chose to begin to work through the branch of the nation of Israel. And God created it to be holy. He's saying here, so anything that will come through it will become holy. If, if, the, if the root's holy, the tree's holy, then it'll become. So in verse 17, he said, If some of the branches are broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. He's literally talking about the difference between an olive tree that just grows wild in, in, in the wild versus a well-manicured and groomed olive tree in an orchard. God said you have a, you have a well-cared-for, groomed olive tree, but then they went, had to cut some branches off of that thing. Had to break some branches off. 
but they didn't want the branches. This tree needs branches. So they went and got an, a, a wild olive tree that had a different nature to it, but then engrafted into the, the well-bred tree, if you could say it that way. Let me read that verse in, in the Jewish Bible. It says, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive, were grafted in among them and have become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree. I think that's a beautiful way of saying it. But what, what, what he's saying is the New Testament church, the Gentiles become a sharer of the destiny. We, 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 we are grafted into something that allows our roots to become Jesus as well. But, but it is not to the expense and cost of Israel as a nation forever. Because it does not appear to me that the Gentiles do not replace Israel other than during the church age. Uh, what happened instead was uh, we as the Gentiles were engrafted in and we began to share the overall cause. We got engrafted into their cause. They were supposed to live separated lives. They were supposed to bring the attention of the world to God. They were supposed to deliver the gospel to the world. And Jesus came and offered the, 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 the new, new covenant to them, but they rejected it. But the root is still supporting us, even though we were, all, we were wild olives that got engrafted into this tree that was not our history. But because we were engrafted in, we are allowed to share in the same type of promises that, that, that are going back to the root. Go down to verse 19. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, that's true. But they were broken off because of unbelief. That's what he said. They were broke, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. But, but then he warned me, he said, now look, don't, don't get all anti-Semitic here. <laughs> and the unfortunate truth is, this kind of teaching is unfortunately where a lot of anti-Semitism came from among, relig among Christian people. And, and it shouldn't be anti-Semitic because he said, be not high-minded, but fear. He said, pay attention here. Now watch, here's why. Verse 21, for if God spared not the natural branches, which was the Jews... If God was willing to break off a bunch of branches off his tree, take heed lest he also spare thee not. Don't go thinking you're once saved and always saved. What time? Oh, Lord, yeah, we're, we're going into another week. Verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. On them which fell, it was severity, but toward thee it was goodness. So to the Jews that were broken off, that was the severity of God. But to the Gentiles that were engrafted in, you, you experienced the goodness of God. That, by the way, Israel had been experiencing up until that time. And if you will continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. And look at verse 23. And they also, everybody say the Jews... If they abide not still in unbelief, they, sh or they, or they shall be grafted, grafted in. Now watch, now watch. You need to underline this one. For God is able to graft them in again. God's not done dealing with unbelieving Jews. What he's saying, he, Paul says, if God did, if God engrafted it one way, he's totally capable of going it in reverse. Amen. For if thou were cut out, where are we at? Verse twenty-four. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by its nature, and were grafted contrary to the nature of the good olive tree, how much more shall these? which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. Again, God can do it in reverse. Now, now he said, now if you were wild olives and you gotten grafted into the good olive tree, and look what happened to you. Look how much fruit you've brought forth. 
Can you imagine what's going to happen when God re regrafts the Jewish people back into the promise again? Verse 24, let me, read, let me read verse 24 to you from the Jewish Bible. It says, For if you were cut out of what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to the nature of a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches, talk about the Jews, be grafted back into their own olive tree? In other words, what started with the Israeli people as an olive tree was in the Gentiles engrafted it in to complete their work that they failed to do. But Paul is making the argument that when this thing's said and done, just like God grafted the Gentiles into the, into the tree, he's going to re-graft re the, the Jewish people back into their own tree. I'm, I, this is fascinating theological stuff to me. Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. I mean, it is a great thing to ponder. Lest you be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel. You are right. Israel is under, but only until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. When the Gentile church age is over, uh, God is going to begin a grafting program that's going to bring Israel back into their original tree. And at that time, when that happens, verse 26, so shall all Israel, uh, let me, I'm saying it in English, say it in King James, so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come one out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. In other words, what they missed with the first coming, they're going to receive at the second coming. For this, and here's why, here's why, verse 27, For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. In other words, that covenant is still in effect. So the church does not fully, completely cover all covenants with Israel. We did fulfill the, their purpose. But as concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. And then Paul makes the argument. He says, for the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. The reason that God is going to engraft the Jews back into their own olive tree is because he made a promise to Abraham. And he's going to fulfill his own word. So what I get out of that, is it appears, if, if, if nothing else, that the promise of the land endures. The promise that was Genesis 26 and 3 and Genesis 35, verses 11 and 12. The Abrahamic covenant is a promise of redemption that would come to the world through a land and through a nation and, through, and it would eventually come to the whole world. It became amplified in the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. Verses 12 through 16. And then, so at, at some point here, it, it seems to me Paul made it clear that by engrafting, God did not throw away his people. He said, I'm not done with Israel, though he has turned a great attention to the New Testament church. Isaiah prophesied that Israel would fall short, and the Gentiles took the message to the nation. And I think... It is an absolutely fair thing to say that the delivery and the preaching of the gospel unto all the world is not being accomplished by Israel. It is being accomplished by the Gentile church. Now within that Gentile church there is a great number of Jewish believers but they're not carrying the, the water. The, the Gentile church is fulfilling their purpose. But God still had some promises of them. So going back to the resurrection of the dead concept is the Old Testament Jewish believers appear, if I'm seeing it right, to be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. And it's during the tribulation that God turns his attention fully to Israel and he lifts the, the blindness and they see him 
and they repent and they cry out and they acknowledge him and they recognize him the way that the earlier generation didn't. I think that that's what makes it a proper interpretation in Matthew 24, that when Jesus said to those, uh, he talks about when you see the fig tree budding, uh, that generation shall not pass until they see the Son of Man coming. In his I don't think it has anything to do with AD 70. I think it has to do with the future and when Israel gets re-engrafted back into the tree. They certainly did in, get engrafted in AD 70 because... Well, that's when, that's when the nation came under the judgment of God and, and, and became scattered, you know, for a season. So, now the resurrection of the wicked, that's a whole other thing. And that still has yet to come at the end of the thousand years. And, that, and the reason that at that time, the, and, and understand when we talk about the resurrection, we're talking about all the humans that have lived on the earth since Adam. This is quite a bunch. And all of us, that we're going to stand before the Lord at the great white throne judgment. We'll get into the great, great white throne later. But, but the point I'm trying to make is these, these, these uh, resurrections, the major big one, the believers and the unbelievers seem to be separated by the thousand year reign and that's why he said in verse 5 of Revelation 20 and the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years was up. So in other words John was saying that God was only dealing with the, the dead in Christ up until that point. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 27 and we're going to read what we referenced earlier uh, let's see where are we at? Verse 50 Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. This is on the cross. And the, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. That's the Old Testament tabernacle and temple. Why was that ripped open? Because the law is over. The, the Old Testament tabernacle work is done. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Now watch verse 52. And the graves were and many bodies of the saints which slept arose oh i'm sorry i, I, I miswrote it in mind and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose now this wasn't talking about new testament saints i don't think i mean they're they're, they're still you know they're just come to the end of the old testament but, you know, let's, let's read on. Verse, verse 54. Now when the centurion and they... Would, oh, and by the way, I forgot to read. And they came out of the graves uh, after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they which were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Now, I'm assuming that these were people locally here that were baptized by John the Baptist, had become believers in Christ. They didn't have the Holy Ghost yet because it's not quite poured out. But they were walking in faith. And, and, and but when, 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 the, when the centurion and all them saw, they said, truly, this was the Son of God. And you ask yourself, well, what in the world is this? We are not told how many people were resurrected, but we know that Jesus represented the first fruits. So, somewhere or another, these people represented dead in Christ, uh, you know, how, however that's going to be interpreted from the scripture. But when Jesus resurrected, some of these saints, and, and the Bible just says many, doesn't say how many, but it evidently was not all. It seems to be a limited, localized resurrection that was specifically for the purpose of confirming Christ's resurrection. Because they could not argue that the disciples just stole his body. <laughs> the Roman government confirmed that anyway with the Roman guards and all that. But the resurrection of Christ is a thoroughly documented event uh, 
But the reality of it is, it wasn't just Jesus that rose from the dead. When he rose from the dead, others went with him, and they were people that they locally knew. And I'm curious, I, now, can you imagine the stir? You, you, are you beginning to understand now why? Just seven weeks later on the day of Pentecost, there were over 3,000 people in one day that responded. Because even though the, the, the church group, the high priest and all that bunch said, no, this isn't it, there was a bunch of people that had seen enough to say, well, if it ain't it, it's something. <laughs> and I went in on it. Everybody say Amen. Tell you what I'm going to do, because if I go into the next verse, I'm going to kind of go into a direction there for a minute. So let's let's stop there. Uh, last week I went two minutes after tonight. I'm going to go two minutes early and redeem myself. <laughs> Stand with me tonight. Hallelujah. I hope you're enjoying this series and stuff. But I, I, I know, I think this stuff's important because it's theology, but it's also important because it has to do with the resurrection of the dead has to do when's, when, when is who being resurrected when. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, uh, we have a lot of the dots, and we're trying to connect the dots. And sometimes the Scripture gives us a pretty good glimpse, but doesn't give us a detailed glimpse. And so some conjecture has to come in, and when that happens, that's where we begin to say, well, I see it this way, and this one sees it that way, and... Uh, uh, but one thing I do think is important is that all of us, we need to see it somehow. And, and what I'm praying will happen in us is that there's a stirring in us that understands that I believe he's coming soon. I even, I even talk about the church age almost like it's over already. <laughs> and I caught myself in a conversation recently with that. Well, you know, we're still here, you know. Uh, but, but that's how convinced I've become of, of this eschatology, you know, that, that of how it's unfolding. And I believe that, that it is. Jesus said you destroy this body in two days or three days, and I'll raise it up. But it didn't happen after three full days. It happened on the third day early in the morning before sunrise. Mm -hmm. And if a day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day, I think we can expect it to be somewhere just after the 2,000 year mark. And folks, that's throwing us into the generation that's alive that saw Israel become a nation. I think we're so close that I'm, I'm kind of talking like the church age is already over. You know? <laughs> Amen. But there's things yet to come. Hallelujah. Let's praise Him. Hallelujah. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your... Your touch tonight. Thank you for all the people that have come to the house of God, loving the Word of God. In Jesus' name, let it be a blessing. Would you clap your hands unto the Lord? Give God a shout of praise all throughout this house. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Greet one another. Love one another. God bless you. Sunday morning, Sunday night, we're going to have... Oh, by the way, I'm preaching Sunday morning, but Brother Burt Ray, Evangelist Burt Ray, is going